Uh, good, so we have some slides. Uh, good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for um, the participants in the talk to, to come in. We've got um, a few at the moment, but um, we'll certainly wait, I think, a few more minutes um, for people to come in and then we'll get going. Thank you. Sorry. That's all right, Jay. So good morning, everybody. We're just waiting for a few minutes to allow people to join the link before we start. So good morning to those of you that have already joined. We are just waiting for a few minutes to allow everybody to join the link before we start. <laughs> 
Right, okay, thank you, Joe. Um, welcome everyone to the latest in our series of Chamber Zoom webinars. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, it's great to see so many of you online today and I hope the series is proving to be helpful. My name's Will East um, and today I want to talk about remedies in proprietary estoppel claims. It's topical because reported and unreported cases in this area seem to be on the rise and it's certainly something I've been experiencing in my own practice. And secondly, because the big debate, both judicially and academically, is about what the principles should be for granting remedies in these cases. Um, as ever, when you have multiple first instance and appellate level cases debating the same topic, uh, it becomes a bit of a labyrinth to determine what the current state of play is. So hopefully that's something I can help with. Now, um, one of the odd things about presenting via Zoom uh, rather than person, so I feel a bit like I'm speaking to the void. So we're going to try and do two things to counteract that. Um, firstly, that um, uh, it would be, I'd be very happy to hear any questions you've got, um, which I'll try and answer at the end. And secondly, we're going to have a bit of audience participation um, in the form of all of you playing the judge at one point uh, or another um, in a mock case that I put together. Um, so we'll come to that later. Before we get going, just a few house, housekeeping rules. Um, you'll notice at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A box. If you have any questions throughout the webinar, please use this to ask your question. Um, and I'll have some time hopefully at the end to, uh, to answer. I think the talk should take about 40 minutes, more or less, um, depending on how many questions we have. Uh, I have to advise you that this webinar is being recorded, so if you don't want to be identified when asking your question, then um, please tick the anonymous box when entering it, so then I won't identify you in your response. We'll have a copy of the recording on the website um, shortly after uh, we finish, so you can look back at it, so, you know, um, hopefully that's helpful. And then um, I don't personally know what this means, not being a huge Zoom expert, but I'm told that to guess the, get the best view of the webinar, we recommend that you view it in speaker view. Um, if you've got any questions after the webinar is taking place, don't hesitate to contact me or my uh, clerk by email, um, details of which are on the website, um, and we've got details there of all previous and upcoming webinars. So, Joe, can I have the first slide, please? So let's start with an overview. Um, those of you who've been involved in proprietary estoppel claims will know that the first stage when you're acting for the claimant is to establish an equity by showing that there were promises and that your client relied on those promises to his detriment. However, really that's just the beginning of the fight because establishing that doesn't give your client the right to receive the multi-million pound property they've been setting their eyes on. And really there's an almost unlimited number of ways that the court can choose to grant relief and the claimant won't always get what they're expecting. On the defendant's side, there's often the possibility to say uh, in correspondence before trial that even if the other side is successful in establishing an equity, they'll be limited to getting something much less than the full claim. And the risk I would say for both sides, and which is why um, so many of these cases settle, is that there's a huge amount of judicial discretion in the area and I would say certainly if you were putting 10 judges in a room dealing with the same case you might get 10 different answers and that's something we're going to test later when I'll be asking you to vote on what award you'd make in a scenario I've put together. Now one of the reasons why you get so many different outcomes is because the existing principles build in so much discretion but another one I would say is because of the controversy over what the purpose of the estoppel doctrine is. So as I've said on the slide, there's a, there's a lively controversy over whether the remedy should be aimed more at satisfying the claimant's expectations or compensating for detriment. And we've got four, no fewer than four, recent Court of Appeal decisions in the area which we'll be considering. And as you'll see as we come to them, um, there's plenty of evidence in the case law now that the court can and will cut down the claimant's remedy as compared with their expectations in an appropriate case. And what I'll try and do is demonstrate some of the factors which can influence this. So could we have the next slide, please? 
So briefly, here's a recap on the main estoppel principles. Um, and there's a very pithy statement of them in the judgment of Lord Justice Lewis and in Davies, um, which is one of the court of appeal cases I mentioned. And you won't necessarily find such a pithy statement in other cases, earlier cases such as Thorne and Major. So you need there to be an assurance of sufficient clarity from defendant to the claimant that the claimant will in future own property belonging to the defendant. It's worth noting this doesn't have to be land. There's a number of cases which establish that other types of property can be covered here. You need the claimant to reasonably rely on that assurance to their detriment, and you need it to be unconscionable for the defendant to insist that they remain the exclusive owner of the property. Now, detriment is quite an important um, area for the purpose of the remedy stage. I'm going to focus on it a little bit. Uh, of course, detriment does not need to be purely financial so long as it's something substantial. So it can take the form of caring for the defendant or the deceased. Countervailing benefits can also be taken into account. So these are benefits which the claimant receives from the defendant in consequence of the reliance on the promise. So an example is free accommodation or being paid for the the work that they're doing. And although you can, as we've seen, break down the claim into separate elements, it's always important to remember that the essence of the claim is to avoid an unconscionable result. Now, you need to keep that in mind at all times, include, including in looking at the remedy. So next slide, please. So during lockdown, we may all be dreaming of escaping to a beautiful beach on a desert island with palm trees, um, which is one reason why I was attracted to this passage from Lord Justice Lewis and Davies. However, sadly, we're not talking about a summer holiday away from the confine of our own homes, but rather about the danger of giving too much latitude to judges in these claims. If you look at um, dictionary definitions, the idea of palm tree justice comes from the ancient notion of the wise old person sitting on a, under a palm tree in the Middle East and deciding how community disputes should be resolved based on their own predilections. But what Lord Justice Lewison is saying here is that although there is a very wide discretion available to judges when it comes to remedy, there have to be principles which apply to this. So what are these principles? Um, let's look and see on the next slide, please. So the judgment of Lord Justice Walker, as the then was in Jennings and Rice, is still of huge influence. Um, and the first thing it does is give a special status to what are referred to sometimes as quasi bargain or quasi contract cases. And these are ones where the defendant says to the claimant, if you do X for me, I will give you this property. Where those sorts of bargains are performed, the theory goes, the court should respect the party's autonomy and simply grant the remedy the claimant was expecting. However, as we will see, this is not always the case. Lord Walker then says, and I think this applies to whatever type of case you're talking about, that if the claimant's expectations are uncertain, extravagant, or out of all proportion to the detriment which the claimant has suffered, then the equity can be satisfied in another and generally more limited way. Um, the idea of the expectations being out of all proportion to the detriment which the claimant suffered is one which caused the appellate judges to get in a bit of a tangle, particularly in a case called Suggett and Suggett. Um, this has now been reinterpreted somewhat in Haberfield and Haberfield, one of the recent Court of Appeal cases, where the court said the focus now is on whether the relief the court is looking to grant is out of all proportion to the detriment. Uh, next slide, please. So continuing with the principles in Jennings, uh, if the court does not think that the claimant's expectations should be fulfilled, this doesn't mean that the court should abandon the expectations completely and just look to compensate the claimant for their detriment. And Lord Walker gives some, in my view, quite compelling reasons for this. Firstly, it's often not possible to quantify the detriment, um, given that detriment, for example, doesn't need to be purely financial. Um, or you might have detriment running back over decades, and it may be difficult to reconstruct the financial impact on the claimant, uh, just as a matter of evidence. Secondly, the claimant may not be motivated solely by um, in, in the conduct that they've uh, engaged in, solely on their reliance on the promises made to them. They may have other reasons for having done what they did, and that could be taken into account. 
And thirdly, this idea of countervailing benefits. Um, if the claimants has been paid or received free accommodation or something similar to that, the court needs to take that into account at remedy stage. And that can actually um, result in um, the claimant receiving rather less than what they claim their detriment is. So given all of this, the court needs to have quite a wide uh, judgmental discretion. Um, and I put a comment in the last bullet point to the reference in the authorities to um, the plaintiff at, at getting the minimum equity to do justice. Um, well, what's made clear in Jennings and Rice that the court doesn't, this, this doesn't require the court to be parsimonious, but the court must also do justice to the defendant. So you've got to, when you hear that phrase often deployed by defendants, you've got to bear that in mind. Next slide, please. So what are the factors relevant to the discretion? Well, there is no exhaustive list given in Jennings or anywhere else, um, and there's no hierarchy of factors. Um, so that makes things even more difficult, as you appreciate. However, according to Jennings, the factors can include um, the conduct of the claimant and the defendant. And it's worth noting here that this is an equitable doctrine. So equitable defences such as late cheese are available as confirmed in the recent decision in uh, Horsford and Horsford. Um, the need for a clean break, um, we'll see that that was one of the main motivating factors for the Court of Appeal in the recent case of more and more. Things like alterations in the defendant's assets and circumstances, so say where um, the, there's been a sale, a part of the land or, or things similar to that. What the likely effect of taxation is and although on to a limited extent, uh, the other claims moral and legal on the defendant and his estate. And that's particularly relevant as we we'll see in lifetime cases. So next slide, please. So in recent times, what we've had is a big revival of the debate over remedies in the cases. Um, it's fair to say that's something that had been raging for some time in academic circles. And what's the reason for that? Well, I would say that it's perhaps because for many years, um, the cases after Jennings until more recent years were cases where the detriment had extended for a very long period of time and there wasn't any logical reason to grant it didn't satisfy the claimant's expectations. But what we've seen in more recent times is a number of cases where there are more reasons to question whether the remedy should really be the claimant's greatest expectations. And so we have the Court of Appeal decision in Davies, um, and this was a farming case where the claimant was given a series of different promises by her parents about um, the family farm, which was worth around 4.4 million. She was given, the claimant was given 1.3 million at first instance, but this was cut down on appeal to 500,000, um, an award which largely sought to um, uh, deal with the, the nature of the claimant's changing expectations and um, and to, to try and figure out uh, what compensation she should receive for, for detriment. Paragraph 39 of that case, um, Lord Justice Lewison re referred to uh, the lively controversy over remedies. And um, he asked, is the essential aim to give effect to the claimant's expectation unless it would be disproportionate to do so? Is it to ensure that the claimant's reliance interest is protected so that she is compensated for the detriment suffered? Or do you look somewhere between the two and try and reflect both expectation and reliance and interest? Lord Justice Lewison had sympathy with the second approach, compensating for detriment, uh, but then declined to answer the question. Um, instead, he introduced the, the idea of the sliding scale, um, which we'll find on the next slide, please. So the sliding scale is this quote here, um, the clearer the expectation, the greater the detriment, the longer the passage of time during which the expectation was reasonably held, the greater would be the weight that should be given to the expectation. Well, how much help does this actually give us? Um, as opposed to a decision that we're focusing on expectations or alternative on detriment, in my view, it leaves a huge amount of room for interpretation by judges and parties alike. Um, and leaves you really in the lap of the gods um, in some cases which aren't, um, for example, cases where you've got very clear expectations over 30 years and detriment over that same period. If you've got something 
less than that, um, you have a real debate on your hands. So next slide, please. Um, in case you're frustrated by me, uh, like me, by the fact we've had so many court of appeal decisions and we don't have absolute clarity on what the um, aim of the doctrine is, we can take some solace in these words from Lord Walker and Jennings. Um, so although <laughs> proprietary estoppel has been around now for many decades, um, the search for the right principles is unlikely to be a short or simple search because it can apply in a wide variety of factual situations and any summary formula is likely to prove to be an oversimplification. So that's really the challenge, certainly, that the judges um, have got to grapple with. Next slide, please. So instead of um, any resolution of this fundamental question, what we've got now is a variety of views being expressed, and here are just a few of them. So Lord Justice Henderson in Moore, um, he took the view that the detriment approach, compensating for detriment, was one which was logically attractive, but was hesitant to give it primacy when cases are fact sensitive and proportionality has, the prominent, has a prominent role to play in the doctrine. Uh, at the other end of the scale, we've got James and James, um, is on Judge Matthews. Um, proprietary estoppel is a doctrine which, like the law of contract, focuses on expectations created rather than losses suffered. So that's very expectation focused. In the Court of Appeal decision of Guest and Guest, uh, Lord Justice Floyd was somewhat reluctant to answer the question, uh, really on account of it being posed in such stark terms. Um, and was more focused on, um, said that the court is more focused on fashioning a remedy which is appropriate and which avoids an unconscionable result. So that's one which would really retain the most discretion um, available possible for the judges, but um, not give too much of a clue for us parties. Then there was lots of interesting academic views quoted in the case of Haberfield. So the, the risks of a detriment-based approach were debated, for example, um, and um, and the risk, I think it's a fair summary of this, is that the risk is that often you're dealing with non-financial detriment. And that's something which is quite difficult for the court to assess and the court might often get it wrong. Um, another view which was expressed by um, Professor Ben McFarlane, a, a major commentator in this field, and Sir Philip Sales is, well, you look to see whether it's a quasi bargain case, first of all, so is it one where the claimant and the defendant agreed what should happen if the claimant um, undertook certain conduct? Um, if that bargain's fulfilled, then you give effect to party autonomy and um, the court will grant relief based on expectations. The suggestion is then that in other cases, uh, one would look to fulfill, um, to, to, to try and compensate the claimant for detriment. So the example is given that if the period of reliance in Thorner had only been six months, the suggestion is that the claim would have been satisfied merely by reasonable remuneration. And it's interesting to note that despite um, Lord, Just Lord Justice Lewison's views about um, uh, tending towards compensating for detriment, um, he was willing to give the idea of party autonomy and bargain cases some support in Haberfield, that's paragraph 68 of that case. So can we have the next slide, please? So applying the principles in practice, um, in many cases, um, for example, in farming cases, you often have expectations which are relatively clear and consistent and detriment which persists for decades. Um, and in those cases, the court is more likely to grant the expectation interest. However, there are increasing numbers of cases available where the award didn't match the expectation interest for one reason or another. So could we have the next slide, please? So some examples of what might be seen as expectation cases, we've got Thorner there, um, we've got Suggett, an interesting case as it introduces the concept of the claimant positioning their whole life around um, receiving the farm. And that's a, a form of non-financial detriment. One thing I'd say is if you're acting for a claimant in a case like this, um, what you want to do as far as possible is um, 
frame your detriment in a non-quantifiable way because from the remedy point of view that makes it much more difficult for the other side and for the courts to suggest that instead you should receive something like a lesser lump sum uh, so less than your full expectation. Um, guest and guest, um, the claimant expected to inherit a sum which would enable him to farm on his own account. And the court, interestingly enough, rejected an argument, uh, a bit like a sort of restitutionary based argument, that he should be given a sum which reflected the increased value he had contributed to his um, parents' farm or something which should comp compensate for his detriment. Um, that was a case with a, a period of detriment of 30 years, more or less. The, mo the most uh, pro-claimant case I've seen, and I'd be interested to hear any comments you have on any more pro-claimant pro cases than this, is the case of Lothian and Dixon, which is a case of His Honour Judge K up in Leeds, um, who I was also the judge in Suggett at first instance, and I think would be regarded as a relatively pro-claimant judge. Um, in that case, the detriment only lasted 18 months and consisted of one of the claimants coming down from Scotland to help the deceased with her hotel in Scarborough. She worked at the hotel and provided um, the deceased with care. The court held that there was emotional strain placed on the, the second claimant. She was away from her husband for months at a time and had to put off a hip replacement operation. Now, it was a bargain case in that the deceased promised the claimants they would receive her entire estate if they looked after her and helped with the hotel. Um, in the end, um, what was actually received um, by them was half of the deceased residuary, residuary estate worth £500,000 when the estate was worth £1 million. Um, and despite the detriment only being around 18 months, the court awarded the claimants the other half of the estate. And the reasons, I think, it's fair to say, uh, firstly, that it was a bargain case. Secondly, although there was a short period of detriment, it was an open-ended commitment which the, um, uh, the second claimant had given to come down and help at the hotel and, and to care for the deceased. And one couldn't tell how long she would go on living for. Thirdly, um, there's slightly unusual circumstances in that the beneficiary of the estate hadn't been in touch with the deceased for years, and so it looked like that would have been a windfall for the beneficiary. But still, I would say that um, this is a, a pretty generous decision. So next slide, please. Um, looking at some cases which could be more termed detriment cases, um, in Jennings and Rice itself, the expectation was that the deceased would see the claimant all right and the deceased also said this will all be yours one day which was held to be a reference to um, the deceased house and furniture worth thirty five thousand. Um, an award was given in the end um, upheld on appeal of two hundred thousand and really the background situation was that the claimant had been a gardener and handyman spent many years caring for the deceased but received no pay um, from the late 1980s until the deceased's death in 1997. 1994 to 1997, the claimant stayed um, overnight unpaid on uh, the deceased's sofa, interesting enough. Um, and the 200,000 was really intended to reflect the cost um, that would have been paid um, for full-time uh, nursing care. Um, and I think one of the um, one of the factors um, that um, influenced the court in making its award was that the the house uh, that the deceased had was unsuitable for the claimant's needs. So it was worth four hundred thirty-five thousand. I think it was. It seemed that it was uh, too big for the claimant. Um, he only needed around one hundred fifty thousand to um, buy one for himself and the other fifty thousand would would cater for his needs so although i think you can see this as a detriment case you can also see it as an expectation case in one way because when the deceased said that she would see him all right as one of the promises um that was to make sure he was financially okay and really that could be satisfied by means of giving him the money to buy a house that was suitable for him plus a bit extra so, uh, next slide, please. 
Another example, um, Powell and Benny, um, 2007 Court of Appeal decision. The expectation there was um, that the claimants um, would receive two properties together worth 280,000 out of an estate of 285,000. But in the end, uh, they received an award of 20,000 pounds. So in terms of detriment, um, they'd made, the claimants had made expenditure on properties, including on the properties, including repairs, and they'd done shopping, cooking, nursing care for the deceased and given them money. Um, but they had been allowed to make use of the properties as they wished and were provided with keys. Um, Mr. Powell um, was a pastor um, and he'd actually used those properties to provide music and Bible lessons there. So there certainly was a, an element of countervailing benefits. I think it's significant that it wasn't um, a bargain case and the claimants weren't required to do the detrimental acts, which they did. And the court uh, held that the countervailing benefits received by the claimants very much needed to be taken into account in, in deciding what the remedy should be. And in the end, this award of 20,000 reflected the expenditure by the claimants and the work done, um, but with a bit of a roundup to reflect their disappointment at not receiving everything. Uh, you might say not that much when they were hoping to get both the properties. Can we have the next slide, please? Um, what sort of reasons can you have for cutting down expectations? Um, without going into the full facts of these cases, which are all very complex, um, here are some thoughts. Sometimes, as foreshadowed in Jennings and Rice, the expectations can be uncertain or they can vary, as in Davies. In that case, uh, the expectations range from the idea that the farming business would be the claimants to the more nebulous she would have a long future at the farm. Uh, to the idea that the farmhouse would be hers, her home for life. Um, the court awarded £500,000 down from 1.3 million at first instance, uh, whereas the farmland and business was worth 4.4 million. And um, the detriment had actually carried on for around 10 years in this case, included working for long hours without full payment and losing the opportunity to, to work shorter hours in the environment of her choice. Particularly in the lifetime cases, there may need to be a uh, there may be a need to provide for others. So uh, more and more, the co relatively recent court of appeal decision is an example of this, I would think. Um, and this is a case involving the son's claim against his father to his um, share in the farm, uh, and the court held that the promise of an inheritance to the son was subject to appropriate provision being made to the parents. And um, because the son in the end only expected to receive the inheritance um, once both parents had died. And so um, the son was awarded the, the share in the farm, but was required to provide in the end the last sum to the mother for her needs uh, and to pay for the cost of care for the father who was in the care home by the time it reached the Court of Appeal. Another feature of the Moore decision was the need to provide for a clean break amongst the, the warring family members who, amazingly enough, had spent uh, around £2.5 million pounds on the cost of that case. And the course of appeal um, was critical of the trial judge's solution, as what the trial judge had held was that the mother should remain on the farm and have sums paid to her by the son for living expenses. And this was held to be unworkable due to the need for a continuing relationship. So there was a, a very strong impetus in that case for a clean break. Um, another reason for not granting the expectation interest might be um, where you've got a change of circumstances or um, the refusal of uh, the claimant to take up offers from defendants, which could amount to satisfying the equity. Um, and this can be true even uh, you can have a reduction here even in a bargain case. So an example here is Haberfield. That's one where the claimant had the expectation of receiving a whole dairy farm worth 2.5 million when her mother and father had died and she'd suffered detriment for around 30 years. Um, but she was only given the lump, a lump sum for the cost of establishing a viable dairy farm. Uh, that was about 1.17 million. 
Ashid for two reasons, really. Um, firstly, because she has rejected the parents' offer to go into a partnership. And secondly, because after this, um, the mother had closed down the dairy unit on the farm. So we, what we had was quite a significant change of circumstances. There was a very recent decision called uh, Horsford and Horsford. Um, now that was one actually where the court didn't even get to the equity stage, but it held that if there had been an, an equity, um, it would have been extinguished because the claimant had entered into a partnership agreement um, with his mother concerning the farm which set out the party's rights um, and so if you've got a situation where you've got promises made but later parties have entered into an agreement which purports to set out what their rights are you might be able to rely on the notion that um, those rights extinguish um, the equity which um, which uh, may have been established previously so could we, could we have the next slide please so what are the strategies for uh, defendants in these cases? Um, I put it this way around rather than for the, for the claimant because I've been acting, I seem to have been acting for the defendant a bit recently. Um, firstly, can you say that the expectations are in some way uncertain if often varying expectations are established because the nature of, nature of the promise changes over time, that might enable you to bring down the award somewhat. Um, Secondly, what about countervailing benefits? Um, so did the defendant receive um, pay or did they receive anything uh, in consequence of them agreeing um, to, to undertake the conduct which the defendant wanted them to? Well, it's important to say that these countervailing benefits which can reduce the award, they've got to be causally linked to the reliance on the promise. So they've got to come about as a result of um, the conduct which the, um, the defend, uh, which the claimant engages in uh, as part of the detriment. And there's an interesting question in these situations over whether, say, a gift from the defendant which is unrelated to um, work which the claimant is doing, does that count as a countervailing benefit? Um, some would say no. Um, can you say that the equity is satisfied in some way? Um, in some cases, many testamentary cases, you have, it's not such a stark decision as the defendant giving nothing at all to the claimant. They might give them something. And as we'll see in the scenario um, I've posed, um, there is a question about whether those benefits are enough to satisfy the equity. What about the moral claims of others? Um, this is important, I would say, especially in lifetime cases like Moore, where you've got the need to provide for other family members. And it was always assumed as part of the promise that the claimant would only inherit um, once both mother and father have died. Uh, so you need, may need to take that into account. And then a, one strategy that I found myself employing in some cases is to try and quantify the detriment and then compare that in an unflattering light with the expectations. So can you, if for example, the claimant saying, well, I wasn't paid properly, can you quantify what that was worth and say, well, actually that's a lot less than the value of the, the huge value of the property you're now claiming. The danger of this approach is that many aspects of detriment are often non-quantifiable. And as I've said, the claimant's tactics often include framing the detriment in that way, in a non-quantifiable way, um, as per Suggett and Lothian. Then finally, um, it's very important to take into account tax and you do need to get in these big cases, um, tax input as to what the effect will be of different options the court might have in terms of satisfying the remedy. Um, for example, if it involves a sale of the assets, um, what, what impact will that have for tax? And in the case of Moore, the Court of Appeal was pretty critical of the parties for not having obtained such um, expert advice prior to the um, final submissions given at first instance because it left the trial judge and indeed the court of appeal without much input on um, what the 
tax impact would be. It's worth saying that there's a pattern in the cases that generally the tax seems to end up being borne by the claimant. So could we have the next slide please? So back beneath the palm tree, um, it's time for a Zoom jury and the way we're going to do this is hopefully you can see um, uh, well, once we launch it anyway you'll be able to see a question uh, under the polling uh, functionality of Zoom. Um, in fact I'm going to launch it now so that we have it um, up and ready and hopefully you can see it um, but please don't answer just yet until you've heard the scenario. So Tom works at a boutique bed and breakfast on, the, uh, on our lovely desert island. Um, this is some way far in the distance um, as a handyman for Pamela and he's paid £15 an hour. About two and a half years before Pamela's death, she takes him aside and says he will inherit the bed and breakfast. And she then repeats this statement several times in later months. We have the next slide, please. Um, and shortly before the promise, the manager of the bed and breakfast retires, leaving Pamela and Tom as the only two people working there. And after the promise, Tom says he works 24 seven at the B&B doing the work of the departed manager and more. He sleeps on site to provide security. He also starts caring for Pamela, who's in her early seventies. And from a detriment angle, angle he's unpaid for all this extra work and says it impeded his family and social life um, and he's now divorced unfortunately after this claim. Uh, the court finds that he told Pamela that he would look after her for the rest of her days um, and knowing that she could live many more years yet. And the court also finds that given Tom's rate of pay he missed out on around £70,000 of pay with all the unpaid work he did before Pamela died two and a half years after the promise but he was still paid for his previous role as a handyman. So he's got some benefits coming towards him there. What happens is Pamela dies suddenly and unexpectedly, having forgotten to execute a will drafted for her, leaving Tom the B&B. &B. Uh, and instead he receives a hundred thousand pounds under her previous will, with the remainder going to Pamela's son who lives back in the, U in the UK. Now we see that although the B&B is loss making, the land on which it stands is worth 1.5 million. So what should Tom be awarded in these circumstances? So we have the next slide, please. Um, so there you'll see the options, um, which hopefully you can see in the poll for how much you would award Tom as the judge. And I'd invite you all to vote now. The options are A, nothing, B, 70,000, C, between 70,000 and 250,000, um, D, between 250,000 and 500,000, E, between 500,000 and 1 million, F, between 1 million and 1.5 million, or G, for those of you who are the most generous, um, the full 1.5 million, no ifs or buts. So I'll just leave uh, a few seconds for people to vote and we'll see what sort of result you come up with. So we've got some, we've got some interesting results coming in. Um, as I look at it, um, we've got uh, five, so we've got four people, we've got 85 people who voted. Um, we've got far, four people who say they would give Tom nothing. Um, eight people who say they would give Tom 70,000, which you recall is the amount of unpaid work uh, he did. The majority, the most people were voted for between 70,000 and 250,000. That's 28 people currently. We've still got some more votes coming in. Um, between 250,000 and 500,000, got 19 people. Between 500,000 and a million, got 19 people as well. Uh, so some more generous there. And then fewer people who are willing to give higher awards, say so between 1.5 million, 1 million, 1.5 million, seven people, the full 1.5 million, 
uh, for people. So if we could have the next slide, please, and I'll give you some of my own thoughts. Um, was the bargain crazy by bit open to question? Um, it wasn't clearly in the facts that uh, it was a case where um, it was a case, I think, where the expectations seemed relatively certain. There was no, uh, no changing expectations or anything like that. But a very short period of detriment, only two and a half years. Um, it's worth saying, though, that it's longer than the period of detriment in the Lothian case, where the court did award uh, the extra £500,000. Um, and whilst, uh, similar to Lothian, whilst we had a, a quantifiable, small quantifiable detriment, what we also had was an open-ended commitment being made by Tom. Um, so rather like Lothian, um, maybe that could play heavily in the court's mind if you had a proclaimant judge. Um, Countervailing benefits, clearly you've got the pay you received and also the amount received under the will. And I think it's of some significance that this is not a case where the claimant helped the defendant to build up the value of the business. Because in my mind, if it was, that's something that the court um, really would take into account, even if um, perhaps in the, in the decision of guest and guest recently, that kind of approach wasn't particularly favoured. Still, I think it would be quite a powerful motivating consideration. My own personal view, where would I, where would I uh, pitch the award? Um, I would go somewhere between 70,000 and 250,000. So I do, do agree with the majority, but I can see that you could end up with uh, a much higher award in this type of case. Um, and so I can certainly see why some of you have gone for between 250,000 or 500,000 between 500,000 and a million. But I think the fact that we've got um, outcomes which are so varied um, in the poll with people um, going for different, different brackets, it shows you, it really does show you how uncertain it is um, with these types of cases. And particularly if you're posing things like part 36 offers, it's just, it is hard to know sometimes where to pitch them. So, uh, next slide, please. Um, that's, uh, that's all I've got to say in terms of the slides. I can see that there is one question which I'm going to answer in a second, but if anyone else has any other questions, I'm very happy to, happy to hear them. So the question we've got is from James Adams, and it's um, how does the uncertainty surrounding the satisfaction of equity impact your advice on proceeding with proprietary estoppel claims, particularly where proprietary estoppel is the only cause of action? And I think the answer to that is that it can't be emphasized too much to clients that this is an area where there is pretty wide judicial discretion and notwithstanding the fact that there have been so many appeals to the Court of Appeal, it may be that it's difficult to actually successfully appeal if you're not happy with the outcome. Um, and I, the way I would tend to provide advice is to think about a range of possible awards and then when we come to discuss settlement with the other side to think about whether the proposal is within that sort of range. Um, because if it is, then it's something that a claimant um, would be strongly advised to consider. I certainly think that it's, these are, this is a, a, an area of uh, law where mediation is very helpful, alternative dispute resolution, because um, uh, particularly where your client stands to lose a lot if everything goes to trial and you have costs of the order of, say, 2.5 million, as in the Moore case. Um, in the end, they can end up with a lot more, I think, by settling these types of claims at an early stage, even if sometimes that's difficult where you've got conduct going back over over many years. I don't know whether there are any, uh, any further questions. Um, if not, 
and I'll just wait for a moment to see if any come through. If not, I want to thank you all for coming along and uh, participating and um, for joining this latest um, webinar in our series. The next one we've got coming up is on Friday. Um, I understand that's with Penny Reed QC and it's going to be on Graham and Lynch issues in rectification claims. It just remi remains for me to say thank you very much to Joe for um, helping to set up this webinar uh, and uh, for helping with the slides as well. Um, thank you for all attending and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.